Eleanor Powells is Director of Biology Collectives and Senior Program Associate with the Science and Technology Innovation Program at the Woodrow Wilson Center. She joins us today to talk about the intersection of genomics and artificial intelligence, an interesting combination of things. But before we dive too deep, I want to ask you a couple of definitional questions mm -hmm. to, to set up the discussion. And one is, what is the da data revolution? So this data revolution is all about your genome. Remember, John, genomics data are the biological and chemical blueprint you are made of. So it's the program that basically designs how your organs and cells are going to work. It's the blueprint that programs how you age and how you fight disease. And when a scientist or a, or a healthcare professional talks about this, is it the same thing that lay people talk about when we look at these tests like 23andMe.com or Ancestry.com? Is it the same science? This is part of the revolution. So, you know, consu consumer-driven uh, genetic testing is part of this revolution. It's basically um, the amount the, the form of technology that lay people have been confronted with, and it's actually really useful in terms of um, starting a discussion about you know, your genome, what it means, uh, where you come from, and how, and how it defines your biological identity. It's one part of this data revolution, though. What I see coming um, and what you know, caught my interest was this convergence between genomics data, new genetic technologies, and artificial intelligence. So artificial intelligence is basically a new field uh, relying on supercomputing platforms. So it's a new computing ability um, to recognize patterns between different big data sets and learn and keep learning from these interactions. And, and, and applying it then in the case of the things you've written about recently to personalized medicine. To personalized medicine, yes, because so what you could do and um, a striking image for this is actually a company in China called iCarbonics. So what this company is thinking about doing is um, actually using their AI technology to give you health predictions. So basically to give you a window into your health in the future. Um, so what they will do is that they will run algorithm through your genetic, biological, psychological, and lifestyle data. And such a data ecosystem could help us understand how our genes interact, how they mutate, um, how aging and disease manifest over time in our bodies and in our cells, um, how our lifestyle choices affect morbidity, and, you know, basically how we react to different kind of treatments. So and, it's and almost a crystal ball into your health. Well, all that sounds good. Early detection is critical in most treatments. Mm -hmm. So what's the dark side? What's the downside? The dark side of personalized genomics eventually becomes personalized discrimination. Oh. So, and to be clear, um, there is right now a new GOP bill that's making its way through Congress. Um, that would allow... Is this H.R. 1313? HR Ominously named 1313. Yeah, H.R. 1313. 13. That would allow employers access to our genetic data. Um, so that's a step, you know, we've never, we've never taken. And it's so how would that happen? So if, mm -hmm. uh, if you had a... Would you have a genetics test as part of your health care plan? How would the data be manufactured in the first place that would give, then give your employer uh, access to it? It would be part of uh, enrolling into a wellness program. So, in a way, Obamacare paved the way for this, uh, this change and this revolution in the sense that you would have to be part of a wellness program, otherwise you pay huge penalties um, if you want to opt out. And part of this wellness program, you would now have to take a genetic test and share these results with your employer. That's brand new. We've never, you know, thought about doing this. Uh, Obama was, the President Obama was a really defensor, an advocate for GINA, uh, the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, and he made really clear that that uh, legislation had to be in place before moving towards sharing any kind of uh, genetic test results. So this new GOP bill is, you know, uh, making almost a devastating attack against GINA in the sense that these results would have to be shared with your employers and it would... Opening the door to all potential types of yeah, discrimination. Yeah, it's a perfect storm for employment, health, and potentially racial uh, discrimination. What, right now, can an employer discriminate uh, on grounds of things like uh, if a person is overweight, if they're a smoker, if they do things or, or, physically, or have physical traits that potentially could lead to higher health care costs? Based on GINA uh, work, you know, genetic discrimination at the workplace shouldn't happen. That's prohibited by this legislation. But H.R. 1313 would change that equation. 
HR1313 would allow your employers to have access to your genetic data, which in a way could be an open door to some form of discrimination. And discrimination based on genetics actually happens. So you have cases of uh, kids that have not been accepted in a school because they have a predisposition for cystic fibrosis, which is written into their genes, even if they don't necessarily uh, suffer from the disease itself. So, you know, your genome can um, manifest some mutations and variations that might not really uh, concretize into the disease itself. So what do you, what do you recommend in this case? What, what types of safeguards should be taken? What types of public policy should emerge? Well, I think people should be in control of their genetic uh, information. So each it's, individual controls. Yeah, it's, you know, in a way, it's part of, it could be part of human rights. So I would imagine to actually have personal data ecosystem uh, where every one of us can actually control who has access to our genetic information, how we want to use it, what kind of health prediction uh, we want to get, and, you know, how we share this data with other people. So would it be ethical to have a prospective employer asking how your health will look like in 10 years? Maybe not. If you don't want to be part of, uh, you know, that, that form right. of, of sharing or that form of uh, uh, openness, you may want to be in control of, of your data. Now, on, on the micro level, it, it's clear what individual value it has. But on the macro level, this has financial value as well, this data. Has. Of course. So the amount of data that's being fed right now um, into U.S. companies and companies in China, for example, uh, those data are already part of, you know, an economic program. They are basically uh, making um, uh, economic, they give a competitive advantage to, to these companies. And, and why Toward the pursuit of things like new pharmaceuticals or a cure for cancer, early detection, things like that. They need all that data to be able to get to that end point. Is that correct? Yeah. So, you know, I give you a striking example, um, a blood test for diagnosing cancer. Mm -hmm. Those are the new liquid biopsies uh, we are waiting for. It's the next gold rush in healthcare. The idea is that you could identify in your blood the genetic markers responsible for certain kind of cancer. So a simple blood test unveiling something that usually remains hidden until other symptoms emerge. Yeah, usually, you know, it might take 10 years, 15 years for you to actually wow. uh, know about a cancer that has been developing for so long. And when metastasis... It's a game changer. Yeah, when metastasis happen, you know, it's, uh, it's pretty difficult to actually have uh, the right therapeutic approach. So, you know, what stand behind this revolution enabled by genomics and AI is prevention detection and, and cancer. It's really those three keywords. So you could imagine simple blood tests for cancer, new liquid biopsies, and those are the heart of a race between China and the US uh, right now. You could also imagine more targeted therapeutics for cancer. So you could imagine to actually run algorithms through huge databases of patient biopsies to be able to actually understand what kind of personalized treatments could have effect on your tumors, on your specific kind of cancer. Is the law clear right now is if someone uh, makes that discovery, it, would they own it the way that a pharmaceutical company can trademark or patent uh, a drug? There is a powerful, you know, dynamic behind innovation and behind uh, this data revolution, which is the ownership of innovation. So, yes, the, the company that's going to be able to create the first liquid biopsy, we'll have a right to, to patent it. Uh, so what, what's going to happen is, is that, you know, the first uh, strength here is really the data. So what companies will do as a first step is probably to keep those data under trade secrets, uh, despite the amount of sharing and of know-how and, 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 and data, most of them will be under trade secrets. And then uh, the next step is to be able to then patent, you know, a specific diagnostic or mm -hmm. a specific treatment. But so it's really vital to our economy and to our health in the future, which country, which company in which country will be able to patent, you know, uh, the new liquid biopsy for a certain kind of cancer, which country will be able to uh, design a new therapeutic that can silence a specific DNA function and save you from a kind of cancer. Well, you mentioned competition between the United States and China in, in uh, this Wilson brief that is available online at uh, wilsoncenter.org at the mm -hmm. uh, STIP website, the Science, Technology, Innovation Program website. Uh, a couple of numbers here that in 2015, I think China committed $9 billion mm -hmm. over 15 years, and the U.S. at that in that same year committed $215 million. 
Yeah. Is that a clear indication of the investment gap on this research? It gives you, you know, a, a notion. What it makes you understand is how China is ready to become one of the best DNA superpower uh, and, and, and how they want to actually dominate precision medicine. So it's, it's a huge investment. In 2016, the Chinese government invested about $9 billion uh, for 15 years into becoming the next precision medicine superpower. Uh, in comparison, the Obama administration had uh, invested about $215 million in precision medicine, but there is some uncertainty about how this uh, kind of research is going to be pursued uh, in, in the future. So um, you see here really kind of um, a race between, between the two countries to, to be able to be the first one to decipher uh, some of those really key mutations in our genome to be able to design better diagnostics and, and therapeutics. In, in this uh, policy brief that you um uh, co-authored, you recommend against that. You have a specific recommendation to the, the Trump administration to avoid a technology cold war with China. Yeah, I think we should avoid, you know, to to build uh, walls and barriers between uh, between China and the U.S. We should, uh, on the contrary, try to engage into a dialogue that would um, create incentives for both countries to actually collaborate. There is a lot we can gain from from collaboration here. And what I find really interesting is that the U.S.-China relationship um, will not be defined by the ownership of manufacturing industries, but it will be defined by this race between genetic technologies, AI, computing, and that will drive the economy of the future. So how much sharing and, and of data and know-how uh, we can incentivize and organize between the two countries uh, would be a gain for both economies and for people. A final quick thought, Eleanor, is that it's a complex t topic, so it's difficult for lay people to dig into it. On the other hand, the implications for each of our lives are astronomically uh, impressive and potentially even scary. So what are the best sources for people who want to engage in this and, and keep up and, and know about things like H.R. 1313 before they become law? Mm -hmm. That's a tricky question. Uh, I mean, we do a, a very good work at translating those complex issues uh, for lay, lay public in our program at the Wilson Center, the Science and Tech Innovation Program. Otherwise, I'm um, really admirative of the press. I think uh, the science press in, in this country is actually of a really high level, you know, from the Atlantic to MIT Tech Review. Those are quite specialized, but um, otherwise, I would say, you know, the, the consumer uh, genetic testing um, companies are kind of a first step to try to understand uh, how your genome is, is built and how it can impact your, your health and, and some aspects of your identity. Um, I would warn, though, about, you know, some, some of the implications of maybe sharing a lot of your data before um, uh, tailored data protection being, being in place. Well, uh, we already live in an age of miracles, but the miracles still to come are mind-boggling. Thank you for being our guide into Thank this you. brand new world, <laughs> Eleanor. Thank you so much, John. Thank you. It's a Appreciate pleasure it. to be with you. Thank you. Thank you.